What is up? Welcome to episode 11 of Etsy Jam. In this episode, we talk about your customers, how reaching out and learning about your customers will put you in a much better spot than relying on information from other sellers about their customers. Welcome to episode 11 of Etsy Jam. Today, we're going to be talking about customers, but not just customers, your customers, not anyone else's customers, not your competition's customers, not some other random person on Etsy's customers, but your customers. It's very important to make that distinction. And so that's the topic for today is specifically your customers. I don't know, Gordon, talking to your customers sounds scary, right? (laughs) It sounds like that could be kind of difficult. Like if I just talk to you about your customers, then I don't actually have to go talk to my customers because talking to my customers could get me in trouble, right? Like what if I'm like, hey, how'd you like that thing? And they're like, well, now that I'm talking to you, you know, and they ask me for something and then I panic, then what am I going to do? Yeah. That sounds scary. But if I ask you about you, right, and just kind of live vicariously through you, then I feel like, well, that's just easier. Can I do yeah, that? It's definitely an easier conversation to have, right? And in that way, too, if somebody's talking to you about your customers, you can kind of pick and choose which information you want to share with them and maybe only share the good stuff like we all like to do on social media. Uh, but... <laughs> That's not going to help you much, right? You're not going to gain as much information out of talking to someone else about their customers, unfortunately. That's Uh, really interesting that you feel that way (laughs) because something I see all the time is on Etsy and anywhere else really is people always are very interested in asking other people about their customers and their experience. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, um, you know, hey, you know, what would you, how did you handle the situation or like learning a framework? And how can I ask my customers and get the information that you gained from your customers that got you to be successful? How do I do that for myself with my customers? They're always, they always want to know from someone that they think is successful. Uh, hey, will you critique yeah. my listings? Will you critique my shops? What do you think about these photos? Right. Mm-hmm. But they're asking other sellers. And unless they're the customer, right, unless they're buying something, an easy test for this is, okay, yeah, they said that. Did they buy anything? Did they mm-hmm. Are they going to buy something? Now, even then, um, until someone actually does buy, I mean, I can tell you that I'll buy something until I'm blue in the face. But until I actually do, you can't cash that check, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important. It sounds like you think it's really important that you really should not be soliciting advice from people that aren't customers. I mean, to an extent, yes, right? But I think that more importantly, the advice you should ask if other people are successful is to learn their framework. Um, and I've come across that before in other kind of business topics and topics in general. The best way to learn from somebody that has figured out something for themselves is to understand how they approached getting to where they are, how they approached overcoming those obstacles, how they approached those moments of enlightenment for their business so you can do the same. Yep. Not do the same thing they did, right? But identify yep. the framework the same way. Um, I have heard it before, and I believe it when it was put this way, that once you learn someone's framework, you know everything you need to know. Because you can mm-hmm. apply that framework and you can think. The same concept of, you know, what would so-and-so do, right? People like to say that a lot, right? Oh, what would Steve Jobs do, right? And things like that. So if you can approach it thinking in this framework, instead of just saying like, hey, uh, yeah, he went and invented the... Uh, the iPod. So I'm going to go invent an iPod and that's going to make my jewelry business thrive. Like, no, that's probably not going to work. Creating a, you know, iPod out of jewelry is probably not going to do it, but you could disrupt something in the same way that he did. He used the iPod. You could apply that framework to something else. Completely agreed. And I think that it, e- it doesn't even have to come from, you know, somebody trying to solicit information from someone else. You don't have to be asking somebody else a question or looking for this information from someone else. This this stuff falls in our laps every day on Facebook groups, on the Etsy forums and all kinds of stuff. People are sharing things that they have done where they found success. Right. So example, somebody posts something and says, you know what? I swapped out all of my photo backgrounds to be like this, the sweet farm that I found this nice rustic background. I took all my products out and there's this really cool old fence there. And you know, I I put my stuff out near the fence and it laid it out really nicely. I did this for all my things. So they're nice and consistent and I get crazy good sales off of that. 
Yeah. And that's fantastic, right? That's that's great advice. That worked for them. Now, does that mean you you can do the same thing and take your stuff out there and take photos? Of course. Does it mean that it's going to work for you? Well, I don't know. You know, it's not going to necessarily work and you won't know until you try it because that might not resonate with your customers, right? They might not be looking for something with so, like a rustic feel to it. So you don't really know unless you try it for yourself. And that's where that person's customers could be completely different from your customers. There's something that you're making that makes you special uh, from them and different from them. And your customers are different from their customers. So it's not easy to just take something that someone else does and assume that it's going to work for you. But what you can do, like Richie is saying, is test that, right? That's what you want to do. You want to take these ideas, keep in mind that, you know, it worked for somebody else. Don't understand. Don't think that it's going to magically work for you too, but test them and, and see if it does work for you. But it's also important to talk to your customers too, right? Um, in talking to your customers, you're going to get a better sense for who they are as people and the things that they're interested in. Now, this doesn't have to be a salesy type call. You don't have to be calling them uh, or emailing them to promote more things. You don't want to be trying to sell them on something. You just want to be getting to know them a little bit better, right? You want to understand them like you understand your friends. In fact, that's a really good way of describing it is if you can describe your customer just like you're describing one of your friends, you're in a really good spot with how well you know your customers. That's a great point. Um, that's really important. Uh, it doesn't, in, in fact, you said it doesn't have to be salesy. I actually would prefer it not to be at all salesy, right? It's a learning, um, yeah. you know, two years, listen twice as much as you speak, right? Um, that kind of thing. Like you're there to learn. You're there to same way. Like if you want to be interesting at a party, you don't do that by being the person that never lets anybody get a word in edgewise. The people that, uh, everyone else prefers to talk to are the people that are like seem genuinely interested in what they're interested about and let them talk to. Right. So the same thing goes for customers, whether it's making friends at a party or learning about your customers, you know, just be inquisitive and don't be looking for anything except for information. Yeah. Do be looking for information, but don't be looking for, you know, a sale or anything like that. It's, now, am I going to get in trouble for this though? Like, doesn't Etsy tell me that I can't talk to my customers? Isn't there something about that where like, I'm not supposed to talk to them? Well, Etsy does promote good customer service. And again, no way are you, are you supposed to be soliciting during this, right? You just want to make sure that they're getting excellent customer service, which benefits everybody in the entire Etsy ecosystem, including Etsy themselves. Because if somebody buys something and I don't know, let's say they're just on the fence. They're kind of neutral about their purchase. So they're kind of like, I don't know if I'd ever purchase from Etsy again, right? And that happened to be something that you sold. Well, you know, yeah, sometimes people fall in the middle and it could just be a simple misunderstanding, right? Something that could have, you know, they didn't understand it or maybe something you could have done a little better, a learning opportunity, right? But following up with them is not a solicitation. That's not something frowned upon. That's just good customer service. Hey, how is this type of thing going? I'm not asking you to buy anything else. I just want to make sure that you're really satisfied, satisfied as much as you possibly could be. And that extra outreach gives you the opportunity to either reinforce a super positive experience or, you know, kind of reset a neutral experience and turn it into a positive one. And then when that's a positive one, when someone has a great experience on Etsy, whether it be your shop or anywhere else, it's a net positive because that person is going to go out and be like, wow, so I bought on Etsy and this person who sold me, you know, this, which I've got, like, got my hand, right? Um, showing whoever I'm talking to, I bought this and they reached out to me to make sure I'm super satisfied. When was the last time I went to Target and bought something and they called me up to make sure I'm super satisfied, right? And a lot of times, if someone's in the middle, people are only going to do, like, say anything, do something if either they had a bad experience or a great experience. And more likely when they have a bad experience. But when it's in the middle, people are busy and they don't feel very strongly to go reach out. So they could have just like a little lingering, oh, I'm not exactly thrilled, I'm not exactly upset. Um, but if someone reached out to me, I have something to say. And I'm gonna be super glad that they actually said something. And uh, if you seem genuinely interested in me, then that's even better, because now I feel yeah. like you care, 
And I mean, honestly, that's that's part of the reason why I shop on Etsy, right? Is because I want to buy something from a person, not from some Chinese manufacturing company who makes billions of those things. And it's just a thing. You know what I mean? Right. It's because I want to have that experience. And it's kind of funny because in all the times I've purchased off of Etsy, I haven't ever had anyone reach out to me like on a personal level and want to talk about my purchase or let me know that they just finished it, that it's shipping, whatever. There's been really not a whole lot of communication there, which is kind of a bummer because I was really hoping, you know, every time I buy something that it's going to be like kind of more of a connection, right? Getting to know the person who's producing this, which is the whole reason that I would be buying something on Etsy uh, instead of buying it on, you know, Amazon or in target or Walmart, like you say. Right. Yeah. When you buy something from a big box, um, retailer or wherever it comes from like a mass produced type thing you know yeah things break you have a warranty and stuff like that and the warranty process feels very cold right it's like hey did you fill out your warranty card Ooh, can't help you or you know let's say you did and they're like okay yeah like here's a number because you are a number you know put your stuff in the box this happens all the time yep things break and it's like they don't really care right they don't care that it you know <laughs> the thing you bought that you needed is broken but on etsy people feel like they have much more of a connection so for a couple of reasons, it's totally okay to talk to your customer um, as long as you're not soliciting. You're not <clears throat> asking them to do things. You're not asking them to join. You're not calling them to say, hey, join my newsletter or, hey, you know, I see you bought a purse, buy another one, um, right? You're just following up, making sure that they had an exceptional experience with you. Which, by the way, you can still do that. You can solicit your customers. You just need to get them to say that you can before you do it, right? So Etsy does allow you to do that and to reach out to your customers and to ask them to join a newsletter or a mailing list or something like that. And once they have opted in, they're totally cool with you reaching out to customers in that way. Right. Yeah, you just can't have them buy from you once, grab their email address, and start you know, sending them a bunch of newsletters and spam <laughs> and like promotion type stuff. Correct. Of course. Correct. Yeah. So now, how would you go about doing this, Rich? How would you set something like this up if uh, if you wanted to get to know your customers a bit more? You know, what would you do? Just email them out of the blue? Uh, would you want to exchange information over email? Would you want to, you know, see if they want to Facebook friend you? Um, how would you go about getting to know your customers? That's a great question. So Facebook friending them, I mean, I guess it t- kind of depends on uh, the level of uh, connection, like what type of connection you have with your customers. If this is something where you've been talking to them for a while, let's say it's like something, you know, maybe a little pricier and uh, custom made, like I know there's handmade and then there's like made for you type stuff. So if it's made for you thing and you're at the kind of level where you think you could Facebook friend somebody, because keep in mind, a lot of people, general retail public, they're not using Facebook for business. They're using Facebooks to share, you know, pictures of their family with family and friends and kind of keep that close knit. So I'll let you use your judgment on who it's okay to Facebook friend and who it's not Um, because everyone has different levels of that. Um, But I would definitely start with like a warm welcome and invite uh, in your packaging, right? So let them know. You could even say like, hey, in your packaging, send them, put a little light, a nice little thank you note and even let them know like, hey, um, in some amount of time, Right. So in a week, in two weeks or however long, depending on your product. Right. I'm going to follow up with you and ask you how it's going, because I want to make sure that you've had a chance to get familiar with it and that everything is going just beyond your expectations. I want to make sure we're exceeding your expectations. So expect this. But if for any reason you need to reach out ahead of time, you can contact me at insert your preferred method here. Right. So that way you've opened the door and you're also letting them know that, yeah, you're going to reach out. And that lets them know right off that you care. And since they know you're going to contact them, they might start thinking, oh, cool. Like I'm going, some people will, and some people will be like, oh, this is going to be so annoying. Like I don't want anybody to contact me. Okay. But those people aren't like your passionate customers, right? We can talk about the thousand fans um, that gets thrown around with like entertainment and stuff like that. We can talk about probably a whole podcast on that. But they're not part of your core group. They're not part of like your hardcore following if they don't want to talk to you. I'm not saying don't sell to them. Um, I'm not saying don't contact them. But don't be upset when they don't want to talk to you, right? Because they're kind of like a one and done kind of customer. And you want people that want to be customers for life. At least a thousand of them. Um, But I digress. Now I've got to get back on track. 
All right. So <laughs> letting them know. Oh, so some people, the people that really care, they're going to start thinking right from then, right from when they know they're going to have a chance to talk to you. They're going to start thinking about what they're going to say to you. They're going to start thinking about their experience. What was it like? How am I liking it? Do I have any questions? Um, and a lot of people find it really, I, I know I do. I love talking to the people that like made the stuff I care about, right? So you've taken the time to make this thing for me. And I get the time to talk to you, the person who made it. And I'm probably buying it because I couldn't make it myself. So that just makes it plain interesting to me. Yeah. And so let's say, too, um, you've set up this conversation with your customer. You guys are exchanging information back and forth over email or you set up a time to do a phone call or a Skype call, anything like that. And you're having this conversation. What do you talk about? Now, you can pre-plan some questions. It's probably a good idea to have some questions pre-planned. You can ask them about their experience. Like Rich said, they're already going to have some, uh, an idea in their head of what they're going to be talking about and kind of think of things on their own. So you can have those things. But in our experience, whenever we've talked to customers, the best information comes out when you kind of go off script and you have these cool conversations that are just real. They're organic and they're, they're real conversations and getting to know these people. And that information can help you immensely because you're going to be learning about your customers. You're going to be understanding they like certain TV shows, right? Maybe you make something that's like game of Thrones related, right? And you, so you start talking about game of Thrones. You find out that a lot of your customers also like this other TV show, Mr. Robot, which maybe you didn't even guess they would have been into, but a lot of them are. Well, now you can tap into that too and have a lot more crossover within your shop, within other products and stuff like that, that you're producing because you're finding these connections between your customers that you, and maybe even they didn't realize they kind of had in common with one another. Yeah, for sure. Especially, you know, when you're, when, when you're making stuff that, you know, you could be your own customer for, you're probably gonna find there's a lot more overlap than you expected, or maybe you did expect it, uh, but between you and your customers, like, but think about it. If you are in some sort of like, uh, you know, small batch, like boat manufacturer, right? Like your customers probably like boating, which is why they're buying boats from you. And guess what? If you're making boats and like you've set your small business to making boats, like you're probably into boating. So you've got a lot in common right there. A lot passion wise, right? Um, same with you make any sort of accessories and stuff like that. Um, you know, for something like, let's say boating, um, you have a lot of overlap and you could, you might even know some of the same people, you know, it's a very small world and the internet's made things smaller and smaller and gets that way every day. And you also never know when you're talking to one of these customers, what type of opportunities they might uncover for you. So you might've just sold like one bag, like one handbag or something like that um, to this customer and your exceptional follow-up and service for them, you know, they might know somebody who has a need for a bunch of them, right? Like a hundred. I don't know why, but it can happen and it does happen. Um, and, but because you talk to them and made that connection, they like you, they're going to introduce you to this other person. It could be a huge benefit to your business. And that's not why you're doing it, but I'm just saying that, you know, good things happen when you get out there, when you get out of your comfort zone, when you start talking to your customers. So another natural question is how much time should you be spending on this? Now, we know that you guys are all busy. It's like there's a there's a million things to do. Um, how much time should you be devoting to talking to your customers? I would say as much as you possibly can. And in fact, over these summer months where sales kind of tend to be a little bit slower for most shops, that was a perfect opportunity to reach back out to people. And I wouldn't even be too worried about reaching out to people who may have purchased from you months ago. You know, I've bought stuff around the Christmas time where if one of those sellers reached out to me and said, hey, you bought this from me. I'd love to talk to you about it. I'd be like, yeah, I remember buying that from you and I'd like to talk to you about that. I don't think that there's ever a time where it would necessarily be too late to reach out to a customer uh, to solicit some feedback from them and get to know them a little bit better. That's a good point, especially if someone's going to buy like a winter hat from you in October and winter doesn't really start until like December, you might wait until the holiday season is over until they've had some time for like, you know, to actually experience it during the winter, maybe still contact them in the winter. So not like in the middle of the summer and you're like, Hey, I was winter in that hat. How's that hat working <laughs> out? It's really great. I keep the AC really cold in my house. <laughs> right. It's kind of a disappointment so at that point. <laughs> Um, so, you know, think timely, but I mean, give them a chance to use it. And I think every product is going to be kind of different too, right? Like let them get acquainted with the product, let them kind of make it their own and then see how it went. 
um, definitely don't contact them before they've even like opened the box, you know, or gotten the product. Um, I feel like I've come across that at some point. Either someone was telling me about it or it's happened, but you know, someone got like, didn't even receive the product yet. And they're getting follow up about like, Hey, how do you like that product? And it's like, it didn't even show up yet. Like, what are you talking about? And that's mm-hmm. just kind of, that's not a great experience. That's not an exceptional experience in the right direction. Like, One of the other nice things that talking to your customers will do for you is, is it's probably going to be a little bit of a confidence boost for you. You know, we're all familiar with the the customers who have a poor experience reaching back out and making sure you're aware of that story, right? And it's kind of maddening if that's your only customer experience is people reaching out to you with, you know, something negative to say, something didn't go the way they wanted it to, they're really upset about whatever, if you're proactively reaching out to people, um, you're probably going to find a lot of people who had a positive experience with your shop. And that's going to just help you confidence wise yep. the next time you have to deal with any kind of customer. Because you're going to start to sway that ratio. Um, there is somewhat of a magic ratio with this. And I don't remember exactly where it came from. And I think it's happy customers tell three people, unhappy customers tell eight people. Um, and then I know that number has been like, played with a thousand times now because they're like, well, it used to be happy customers tell three people and, they, and then unhappy eight. But now with social media, they'd say, they'll, they tell 8,000. And it's like, okay. But only eight of them are listening. Yeah, but only eight of them are listening. Right? <laughs> so then you get into this whole conversation about like reach and engagement. So we'll just stick with the original, you know, three and eight. Because I take it to, you know, okay, happy customers will do something, tell anybody, you know, three of them will... They'll go do that. Uh, but the unhappy ones, yeah, like they're going to go ahead and you know, do that at the same rate, regardless of their channel, right? Because even without social media, it's still, come on, like it depends. Like some people just have like bigger groups, bigger connection groups, bigger networks that they'd go tell, right? Some people are going to stand on stage and tell an auditorium about their bad experience and other people won't. So I think there's always exceptions to the rule. But the main point is, like you said, Gordon, you're going to uncover so many more happy customers if you reach out to them because the ones that are most inclined to actually reach back out to you and say something are the ones that are the most unhappy. Unfortunately, that's just kind of how it works. You know, they're the ones that feel like they have to vent. And for whatever reason, when we're really happy about something, we don't. And that's why, you know, a lot of you say it's hard to get reviews because, well, a big thing is people are like, you know, the what's in it for me, Right. There's the what's in it for me, so why should I leave you a review? But then there's also the, well, does my review matter, right? Mm-hmm. And if people don't think it matters, then they're not mm-hmm. going to take the time to do it, mm-hmm. except for the people who have a bad experience. And then they're going to go out, and they're doing it for them. That's why they're doing it. They're doing it out of some sort of revenge, and that's the what's in it for me. But a lot of good people that have a good experience, if, if, they, have a good ex- if they have a good experience and they have a good reason why, to go leave a review. So a lot of good people want to help you. Okay. That's still a very valid reason to go leave a review. If they believe it's going to help, they're more inclined to do so. Not all of them, but they're definitely more inclined to leave a good review. They had a good experience. If they believe it's going to help you. Now, the other thing you are kind of risking when you're only talking to customers who have had negative experiences is all of the information you're gathering about those customers is going to be a common thread between the kind of customers you probably don't want, right? That that's the experience of a customer that you don't want to have. You want to have less of those kinds of customers. Yes. So if all of your information that you're gathering is from the kind of customers that you'd rather not have, like you're only going to be catering with any changes you make and, and anything that you're doing is going to be catering to more of those type of people, which is exactly the opposite of what you want to be doing. You want to be reaching out to more of the customers that you want to have. Like wh- what makes those people tick? How can I learn more about them? Because I'd love to have more people like them. Agreed. I feel like there's an 80, 20 rule in there too. Um, and in fact, I know there is cause I've read about this too. Uh, the, you know, like 20% of your customers, cause 80% of the problems, right? So they cost you 80% of everything, like 80% of your costs are coming from them because they can be very high maintenance. And these are those ones that aren't great customers. They're the ones that give you this runaround all the time. They're the ones that, and again, on Etsy, we see this um, all the time. Customer orders something, um, doesn't pay for like the expedited something or other. Um, And then they wonder why it's not there like the next day. 
right? And it's like, yeah, wait a minute. I, thought, you, I had Etsy Prime. Like, I was doing <laughs> Etsy Prime. I get two-day delivery, right? Oh, don't even start and make people think that exists. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in the settings somewhere. I think, I think I'm paying for that, right? Doesn't Etsy stream videos for me, too? <laughs> <laughs> no. I can see that sometimes this can be somewhat of a confusing because, you know, it'll be like, okay, so the customer... There's normal, so normal like fulfillment. Okay, it's going to take this long, and shipping is going to, like so. Production is going to take this long, shipping is going to take this long. Okay, well, you, you put this product in your cart, and that's what you get. Or you put the product in your cart, but plus you also buy this other item, this other listing that's like expedited uh, production. Okay, so you bought that, um, but then you also you have to buy the expedited shipping too. You got to buy the shipping upgrade. So now it's like two different things, and sometimes it gets really confusing, and people just don't understand. But then. There's that confusion matched with, you know, procrastination because like people are always going to buy something the last minute, right? Like you look how many people go uh, like, you know, Christmas shopping, holiday shopping, um, whatever the occasion is, birthday gift shopping uh, the night before the actual before they need it. Right. Um, there's always people at the store doing that. Well, people try to take that same mentality online. Right. They try to squeeze the timelines. Um, so, you know, they get upset um, about that. And funny story. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I want to hear your funny story. I, I'll, I'll inject my funny story after you're done. Nope. I want to hear now. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> funny story. I used to work with a guy uh, who was an older guy and he always did his Christmas shopping last minute too. And he swore by his plan. He said his plan was perfect. And this is what he did. He said he would get dressed up in a very nice suit and he would go out to the mall and he would look around like he was clueless. And inevitably, a salesperson would come over and try to help him find exactly what he needed to get, and he'd be in and out of the store really quickly. Now, it's kind of funny, right, to imagine somebody doing this, and I certainly can't picture myself doing this, but I think what he's really trying to do is get that personal experience, right? Yes. And I think a lot of people crave that. They, they want to have somebody kind of like a concierge-type service for them, helping them through something. And obviously, the more contact you have with your customers, the more they're going to feel like they're getting that. Maybe they don't even have to put a suit on for it. <laughs> uh, well, next time I message somebody asking like where my order is, why it's not here faster, maybe like, and by the way, I'm wearing a suit right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing a suit, but just the top. I have pajama shorts on. Because, I mean, come on, I'm at home. <laughs> you know, and you can't see me because I'm just writing a text message. <laughs> um, I'll use the suit emoji. But, you know, sometimes to continue the thought, um, you know, sometimes the, these misunderstandings, like sometimes they're just a misunderstanding. Sometimes it's just like unreasonable customers, right? Or they want uh, customers to demand discounts and stuff like that. We see this too. People are like, I don't, I don't have much profit margin in this to begin with. And then, you know, I've already given this person a break and then I ship it to them and it's not exactly what they want. And they want to either return it and not pay shipping costs which like completely ruins my profit plus to his custom. So I can't even resell it. Um, or they want like a huge discount that again, wipes out everything. Um, and it's like, well, that's just an example of a bad customer. Like you don't want that customer. You can't afford to have that customer as a small, yeah. uh, a small business like this on Etsy. Yeah. That's um, a bad experience for both of you. Absolutely. Right? Not just the customer. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. You can't, you can't find more of those. Be like, Ooh, okay. Well, if I satisfy this one and then they bring their unreasonable friends, like, wow, I could have a lot of, <laughs> I have a lot of sales. And make no money or lose money, um, which isn't a, is not good for anybody. Um, but I see people. I like that idea of unreasonable friends, man. I picture these people having like groups, <laughs> just these groups of unreasonable people who just love to get together and be all snooty and complain about stuff together. Like, uh, I bought this thing. It was horrible. You should buy it, too, so you can complain, too. Oh, I love complaining. Right? Yeah. I, I bought this thing. And it, was, it was awful. And then I told him how awful it was. And I got a 20% discount. You should totally go buy it, too, and tell him how awful it was, and then you can get Mine that was terrible, too. too. Right? Tell him it didn't show My up My friend bought enough. this and said theirs was also terrible. I know this is re re repetition. <laughs> right? It sounds awful. <laughs> that sounds like an absolute horrible group. And if you can find them and identify them, like, <laughs> don't sell to them. Or make I envision them like as the people that go to a restaurant and they're all mm -hmm. eating together and then they like plant stuff in their food like fake insects and hairs and stuff and then call the waiter over and be like, there's a hair in my food. I want my food for free. Oh my God. <laughs> that sounds awful. That's what they do in my head. Yeah. <laughs> Your head sounds like a scary place. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad group, man. It's a real bad group of people. It does sound bad. 
I could I could definitely <laughs> see groups of people doing this though. Like you know, like oh, I went to this restaurant. It was awful. You want to go? <laughs> 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 kind of like when someone takes something out of the fridge and they're like, I think this went bad. You want to smell it? It's like, <laughs> you shouldn't, no. you shouldn't want to, right? But people do that kind of thing all the time. They're like, oh, this is awful. You want yeah. to see? Like, you, the answer should be no. <laughs> yeah, I want to see. <laughs> um, but yeah, I see people spend like a disproportionate amount of their time and energy, either one, being upset about it or two, talking about it. And making them more upset about it. And, and, you know, not that I can tell you exactly how to resolve this because I don't think you need to like, leave it unresolved. But in general, if you can figure out, like, what gets people into that trap and, uh, like, customer-wise and stuff like that and avoid it and just kind of set it up so you can, like, that type of customer just kind of moves through your funnel and out because you really don't want that mess. And if you do run into that mess, don't spend a disproportionate amount of time on it. Right. You have other people to, you know, to satisfy out there. You have other customers to serve and you're not doing good customers any service. If you spend all your time trying to please people that are bad for your business, the customers that are bad for your business. And you, oh, if it makes you feel any better, you owe it to the customers who are there for you, your true fans. You owe it to them to spend your time on them. Right. They're the ones that are there for you. Right. Um, so. There you go. Spend your time with them, not on the ones that aren't good for you. Absolutely. And everyone will be happier for it. Everyone will. Absolutely. Everybody. Yeah. I think so. Anyways, like when you do these things, they're just kind of like net gainers. I think it's good for the whole ecosystem. Completely agreed. Yeah. So get out there. Talk to your customers. Shoot them an email. Shoot one an email right now. Just reach out and see how it goes and, and what happens. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to be with it. And you're not going to think it's as big of a deal right. the next time you do it. And then the next time is easier and the next time is even easier. And you get into a groove. And I think you're going to find that it's fantastic. Absolutely. It is a good thing to do. And it feels good. It does feel good to hear from people that enjoy what you do for the world. Um, and like the, the change you make in their life, no matter like how small it might be, um, if you can help them, it feels good to know it. Yeah. Um, I mean, how much cooler would it be to have a, a nice connection and a positive experience buying something like that when all of us are so used to buying things where we don't have that? You know, I'm used to going to the store, groceries, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. technology stuff that I purchase and things like that, like microphone, mixing board, you know, random stuff like that. I'm not expecting to talk to somebody about this and hear the story about how, you know, they designed it and. Um, you know, their family has been building mixing boards for years and, and they've, they just love doing it. Right. No, I'm not going to get that with that. And so in an experience where I could get something like that, it would make it stand out that much more to me. And what's interesting about that is when more people start getting that experience, more people like that, more good people are going to flock to that platform. They're going to start yep. going there. So if, if you, if everyone gets together and makes it a really positive experience to shop on Etsy, it's going to keep attracting more really good buyers, right? And if you don't spend a lot of energy on the negative ones, then it's going to keep them away, right? They can mm -hmm. go where that type of behavior is enabled, right? They can go over to eBay. I hate eBay. It's the absolute <laughs> worst platform in the world. Um, so don't go there. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. If you have an eBay account, delete it. <laughs> um send all your negative buyers over there they'll get the there you go for there yeah there you go yeah they'll feel right at home they'll feel at home with all the other negative buyers that they will <laughs> that they will <laughs> they can run their little scams they'll get in their little groups yeah yeah they can plan scams have breakfast together mass hysteria agreed <laughs> <laughs> It sounds awful. It really oh. does sound awful. It does sound awful. Well, next week, do we have a guest next week I think, on Etsy Jam? I think we yeah. do. I think we do too. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> we got a guest coming up. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Hopefully, we're going to get our technology end of this sorted out before then. Uh, we've been playing around with some different setups and stuff, trying to get the best recording quality for you guys while still maintaining a live aspect to the show. And that's a real challenge. Uh, so while we're plodding through this and trying a bunch of different things to experiment and find out what works best from multi-party video 
calls <laughs> where we can stream in high quality and also save a nice high quality recording too. Uh, we will keep plugging away at that, <laughs> but we have a guest next week, so that's going to be awesome. And we will be talking to them. Um, any closing words, Kevs, Richie? Oh, that's a great question. Um, okay. Closing thought. I don't think I've used this one before. But you can tell a lot about what you're really committed to by looking at your actions. Okay. So uh, you say you want something and whether if your actions support it, you really do. But a lot of times we say we want something and then our actions are hanging out on the couch eating potato chips. And that doesn't really support your goal. So I love potato chips. If you want to know what someone, including yourself, is really committed to, take a look at their actions. It's called or like barbecue. It's stated preference or revealed preference versus stated preference in economic speak. The things you like say versus and onions the things you do. Sour cream and onions do sound good. So <laughs> maybe some like Cool Ranch Doritos. Oh, that sounds good. Like those nachos we made. <laughs> Remember the nachos oh, yeah. we used to make? Oh, dude, we need to make. We need to do that. We do need somehow. to make some nachos. We can show our nacho recipe. Yes. Oh, man. Mind-blowing. Right? We need to bring Kevin in on this, too. We never shared the recipe yeah. with him. Yeah. No. <laughs> we got to do it sometime. I don't know. We'll have to set this up somehow. <laughs> somehow film our nacho. <laughs> probably, nacho meal. I mean, probably not next episode because we'll have the guests. Right. Right. And we don't know if they like nachos. But I don't even <laughs> know if it's a jam. Maybe it's just a video that we release and we share with like the recipe with people for just a fantastic, healthy snack. Oh, that's a good call. Mm-hmm. I like that. I will, you just said healthy, though. It's, it's definitely not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a delicious snack and one that's well deserving if you've talked to some customers. And, you know, like that's a good reward. That's a good way yeah. to build a positive association, which I guess is another thing, kind of a closing thought. When you do something that's good for you or good to do in general, give yourself a little reward so you actually build a positive association with doing that. There you go. Yeah. Uh, there's a word for this. Um, I don't remember the word. Positive reinforcement? A positive reinforcement is definitely one of them. There's a neuro something. But, yeah. So, Neuropositive reinforcement? Yeah, I think that's what it is, Gordon. There's got to be what it is. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, it's, it's the basically the practice of like rewiring yourself to enjoy the things that are good for you instead of the things that are bad for you. Like... A lot of times, like the Doritos and the nachos that aren't necessarily great for you, they taste delicious and they're full of things like salt and sugars, which, you know, our brains trigger as like, that's really awesome. I'm going to keep doing this because like that makes me feel good. Um, there's all the good chemical stuff in your brain and all the bad stuff to your body. Um, so if you can do something good and give yourself a little reward, um, even if that reward is something that's not as great for you as long as you're doing something positive with it like i'm gonna eat a salad and then i'm gonna have a cookie like okay that's cool it's a lot better it's than better just than eat. just the cookie it's better than just the cookie <laughs> or a bag of cookies right <laughs> or i mean a bag of potato chips and then a bag of cookies like i need the yeah. salad okay good like i wouldn't have had that otherwise okay right um actually something that uh i started doing because sometimes we get too lazy to like Go, we wait till the last minute to go grocery shopping, and that's like easier to just go get something like to go um, than to just like go grocery shopping, especially when you're hungry and stuff like that. So, I have tried this experiment, which is when I go grocery shopping, I also pick up some of that sushi, some of that prepared sushi they do because they have some yeah. good sushi there. Yeah, um, because I like it, I like that a lot. Um, so, even though it's somewhat pricey, it is still net cheaper to go go there get the positive reward of the sushi buy the groceries and eat the sushi while i'm getting whatever ready right so that way i do have something to eat in between which also solves the other problem of like i'm hungry now still a lot cheaper yeah. than all the times you end up going to eat out right mm -hmm. and you gotta go get all these meals um eating out because you were too lazy to go grocery shopping and it seems to be working pretty well i, I do enjoy and get pretty excited about going to you know pick out some sushi um, when I go grocery shopping now, you know, the other way you can look at it too, is I would say that if you're practicing that creative 
fast that we talked about where you're not eating for a day. Oh. You know, you can eat a 2,000 calorie plate of nachos the following day <laughs> and not feel bad about it because you didn't take in any calories the day before. Yeah, that might be a good way to feel good about the fast also. Like, ooh, when <laughs> day after I fast, I get to eat a 2,000 calorie plate of nachos and that tastes delicious. The sugar and the salt, be magnificent. you know, all the beef and the fat, like everything that's in here, you know, that. All that good processed food. Oh, oh like that liquid cheese, you know. Mm. <laughs> For a closing thought, that went a little bit long. That did go kind of long, but I, hopefully everyone's salivating now. Let's hope so. all right so what's your closing thought oh i don't know man i think i think we had like three i don't want to waste them you know i'll save one for next week no you gotta do just something just closing words from both of you you go first though that way kevin has a minute to google it (laughs) (laughs) i don't know guys you guys are Uh, you're so better than this than i (laughs) than me There's a closing thought. Uh, All right, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> You're left. <laughs> oh, let's see. I don't know. I think I go back to experiences, okay. right? And I, th- I think that the more effort you put in to delivering a good experience for your customers, the more you're going to experience positive things for yourself as well. And it's it, it all comes back to that for me. And so I would say always shoot for delivering the best experience you possibly can, you know, by doing, you know, hustling as much as you can, your actions, but also by learning about your customers and learning how their experience was and trying to improve it as much as possible, because all the effort that you spend on that is going to come right back to you and allow you to enjoy positive experiences as well. Nice. You know, I was just thinking, I was thinking about like how the, the vibes you put out there, like the vibes that come back, like positive is attracted to positive. And I was just thinking about that in terms of like, you know, electricity and like atoms and stuff like that. And that's not true. Positive and negative are attracted to each other. Opposites attract. So that means if you do positive things, the negative things should happen. How come that law doesn't follow through? Maybe it does. Maybe it does. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. So on that seventh and final closing thought... (laughs) <laughs> we will see you guys next week with a guest with a on guest. Etsy Jam. With a guest. Nice. <laughs> see ya. See you later. <laughs> <laughs>